Happy Wednesday! You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. This week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, we'll be covering the case of Candy Montgomery, who was a stereotypical 1970s, 1980s housewife who got bored with her mundane marriage and her life in general. She decided that an affair would fix her boring life completely. But when Candy's secret lover's wife was axed to death over 40 times, Candy's deepest and darkest secrets would be revealed during a trial where she was acquitted after it was determined that she acted in self-defense. And since we're all here for one thing and one thing only, let's get it. Candace Montgomery, who just went by Candy, was born as Candace Wheeler in Lucas, Texas on November 15, 1949. Candy was raised as an army brat and always moved from army post to army post with her family growing up. They lived in new cities, new towns, states, and even different countries every few years. Candy made friends easily, even though her family never stayed at one army post for more than a few years at a time. Making friends came naturally to Candy since she was such an outgoing little girl with such a larger-than-life personality. But that wasn't always viewed as such a good thing like it is today. Back in the 50s, women were supposed to keep their mouths shut, stay in the kitchen, take care of their husbands and kids, and they weren't supposed to complain about any of it. As Candy was growing up, her mom instilled in her that hiding your emotions was the ladylike thing to do. So instead of showing her daughter love and acceptance, Candy's mom made sure that Candy knew that the way people perceive you is more important than your emotions and the way that you're feeling. And Candy would carry this lesson with her into adulthood. As Candy got older and she started to develop, the boys that she went to school with started showing her some extra attention. And it almost seems like she kind of lived for being lusted over. It was such an escape from her normal numb feelings You know, because you have to hide your emotions in order to be ladylike. Candy's parents were strict and overbearing with the way that they raised Candy, and like it normally does when parents are too overbearing, kids and teens usually lash out, and the whole being strict and overbearing thing kind of ends up backfiring in parents' face. And as Candy got older and was allowed to date, she dated and lost her virginity to a man named Chris, who would later try to propose to Candy, But Candy's parents said that she was too young to get married, and eventually Candy moved, and the two ended up drifting apart, and eventually they just lost touch with one another. Candy periodically dated a few other men, but they didn't seem to be quite the husband material that she was looking for. Candy later says that after her almost marriage to her high school boyfriend, Chris, and after enough failed dates that she had kind of lowered her standards for what she deemed as good husband material. Because all Candy really wanted out of life was a few kids and a nice house with the idyllic white picket fence. She hadn't really taken into account the fact that she may need a husband to help make the kids, of course, and to pay bills. Candy dated a few good prospects, but these men would eventually be ruled out for things like not making enough money or not being highly educated enough. And Candy had even considered marrying a man later, and she couldn't even recall this man's name when asked about it. And the only reason that the unremembered man was a good husband prospect was because his best friend had married Candy's best friend at the time, and that seems like good logic. When Candy was 20, she moved out of her parents' house and got her own place in El Paso, Texas. She took a job working as a secretary, which is how she was introduced to her soon-to-be husband, Pat. A co-worker of Candy's was insistent about introducing Candy to her 25-year-old son, Pat. Pat was living in Dallas, Texas at the time, so he was only in El Paso for short stints at a time to visit with his parents and family when he could find time off of school. When Pat came to El Paso to spend a few days with his family, he was shocked to find that his mom had set him up on another blind date with the woman that she worked with named Candy Wheeler. Even though Pat was a few years older than Candy, he seemed to be less experienced than even Candy was. He was the shy, quiet type, and Pat worked for an electrical engineering company, so he made good enough money to qualify as husband material, But he wasn't extremely handsome, and Candy even recalled thinking to herself that she had dated worse-looking men than Pat before, so that was no big deal. Later, when Candy recalls her and Pat's first date, she said that this was easily the dullest date of her entire life. She just wasn't feeling Pat whatsoever, so when the end of the first date rolled around and Pat asked Candy to go out with him again the next night, she said that she even kind of surprised herself when she agreed to go on a second date with him. The second date was no better and no more exciting than the first. Pat was shy and kind of awkward around women, and when Candy could get him to talk, he mainly just talked about his work as an electrical engineer. So when Pat asked Candy out for a third date in three days, Candy just told Pat to give her a call the next day, and they would figure out what they were going to do as far as the third date goes. 
Handy had no intentions of going on this third date, and she made sure not to get home until really late in the night for the next few days so that she would purposely miss Pat's call, and he would eventually be back in Dallas, Texas, which is nine and a half hours from El Paso, where she lives, and he would be forgotten about before she knew it. Candy kind of ghosted Pat before ghosting someone was even a thing. Pat tried calling Candy that evening that they had planned for their third date in three days, but Candy had made it a point not to be home to answer those calls because the no-caller ID was a real struggle. So Pat just assumed that Candy had forgotten about their plans, and he never did figure out that he had been ghosted. (laughs) He was oblivious to it. Candy's plan worked like a charm, and Pat was back in Dallas, Texas the next day. No harm, no foul. She assumed that she would never see or hear from Pat again and that her plan had worked. But when he got back home to Dallas, Texas, Pat sent Candy a dozen roses and a pretty cute, funny kind of card that he had written inside of, and it said something along the lines of, I hope you got all of the sand out of your pants in reference to the beach that they had walked down for their second date together, where Candy kind of joked later that she would just never get all the sand out of her red pants. Candy thought that this small gesture was adorable, And she even liked it so much that she ended up calling Pat at his job to thank him for the flowers and the card. And when Candy called to thank him, the two agreed to meet up for another date the next time that Pat was in El Paso. But that trip would end up coming a little sooner than either one of them expected. Because in 1970, Pat's uncle unexpectedly passed away, which caused Pat to have to come home to El Paso sooner than he had planned. This wasn't just any regular old uncle. This was one of Pat's closest family members, and this uncle had always been just another father figure in Pat's life. On Pat's second night back in El Paso, he called Candy and met up with her at her house. From Candy's house, the two walked through a park, and they just kind of talked. This date went so much differently than the other dates that they had been on together. Maybe it was the fact that Pat was grieving an incredible loss, or he was finally comfortable enough with Candy to be his true authentic self on this date, because this date went immaculately. Pat opened up to Candy about the loss of his uncle and how it was already affecting him. He was kind and funny, he was smart, and he was really sweet. It seemed like he had lost all of his shyness altogether just in that one date. Pat talked to Candy about how he wanted a PhD as an electrical engineer and made Candy feel like she was the only woman in the world that he could see. And Pat was also seeing Candy in a new light on this date too. When he looked at her now, he saw the face of comfort and peace in his time of grief. And even though Pat wasn't exactly what Candy had been searching for in a husband, she thought that Pat just might be a perfect compromise. So after this date where Pat had opened up to Candy and he seemed to be more of the marriage material that she was looking for, the two agreed that they would go on another date together the next time that he was in town. And until then, they would just write letters back and forth to keep in touch. After this last date with Pat, Candy told a friend that she had found the man that she was going to marry. This friend was intrigued and asked to know this man's name. Candy couldn't recall his name, though. She told her friend that she thought his name was Pete. Y'all, his name was Pat, not Pete. And she's talking about marrying him. She couldn't remember his name, but she knew that she wanted to marry him. Okay, I'm not here to judge. Okay, I'm judging a little, but we're going to keep going. The two would eventually be in a long-distance relationship with one another before either one of them realized what was even happening. Since Pat was living in Dallas, Texas, and Candy was still in El Paso, Texas, where the two had originally been introduced, and the travel time would have been about nine and a half hours in a car ride to see each other one way. So, since it was the late 60s, early 70s, this would have been the most logical way to stay in touch with one another. Between long-distance calling fees and such, letters were just the way to go. And the two wrote to each other constantly. They would visit each other on weekends and, of course, make the long-distance phone calls when they could in order to help keep in touch. And they did this for a month or so. That was until the two got engaged after only spending four weekends together and knowing each other and talking with each other via letter for about two months in total. They didn't stay engaged for long either after the engagement in 1970. They both decided that they wanted a wedding sooner rather than later. They were ready, and this was about to be everything that Candy had ever dreamed of. All she had ever wanted was a good husband with good morals and a nice family who had a stable life and a good job, of course, that she could call her own. That would be enough for Candy Montgomery. Until it wasn't. The two didn't waste any time, and immediately after the wedding and a night in a honeymoon suite, Candy moved in with Pat and the two began their lives together in Dallas, Texas. 
They worked through the kinks of being newlyweds and learned what annoyed each other, and they settled into life together. Candy started talking about having kids almost as soon as their marriage was final. They were still settling into newlywed life, but soon after the marriage, Pat got an opportunity to finish his degree in Boulder, Colorado, so the two packed up and headed to Boulder after being in Dallas for about a year. And even though Pat was still working towards his PhD, he wasn't quite rich yet, forcing Candy to get a job and forcing Pat to work two jobs. And even with all three incomes, they still only brought in about $300 a month with their wages combined. This was fine. She could live like this for a while until his degree was finished and the money got better. But the arrival of a baby girl in 1972 made their money problems more prominent than they had been before. And even with financial troubles, the two couldn't have been more excited about their baby and they named her Jennifer, even though they would call her Jenny for short. Pat finished up his work on his degree in Boulder and the couple and their new baby, Jenny, were about to move back to the Dallas, Texas area. And soon after this move, they were finally able to buy their first home in Plano, Texas. They settled into their lives in Plano in 1974. The couple had another baby and this time it was a boy. They would name him Ian. And since they had a boy and a girl now, Candy decided to get her tubes tied immediately after having Ian. As the years passed and the kids got older, Pat and Candy decided that they needed to find a church family to call their own, just for the sake of their kids, because both Pat and Candy claimed to be agnostic. They decided that church would be what would be best for their kids, and they eventually decided on the first United Methodist Church where they quickly made friends and got involved in almost all the church activities that they could volunteer for. Now, at this time, Pat was making approximately $70,000 a year on annual salary, which is about $332,000 a year with inflation and being converted to the $2020 amount. So the Montgomery family wasn't hurting for anything, and they lived a fairly comfortable life together. The Montgomery kids made friends easily, and Candy and Pat's oldest child, Jenny, was best friends with Alyssa Gore, who was the daughter of another member of the church family, Alan and Betty Gore. And in this case, Candy and Pat aren't the only key players. Betty and Alan are even bigger key players in this case because Betty is the victim. So who are Betty and Alan Gore and how did they end up in Texas? Betty was the firstborn and only girl out of the rest of her siblings. Betty grew up in Kansas and as she grew, she was very pretty but not in a flashy way. She developed quicker than most girls her age and she was a good student. She also played the clarinet in the school marching band. Betty was very much into her religion, though, and helped her parents with almost anything that most teens would normally grunt and roll their eyes at. Betty was popular, and the boys went crazy over her. And even though Betty always seemed to have different boys fawning over her, she was just kind of passing the time with each boy waiting on her knight in shining armor to show up and sweep her off her feet. Betty liked the Beatles and Elvis, and she wrote in her diary, and she loved going to the movies. Betty enjoyed what they called riding around with different boys, which would be the equivalent of a real date during this time period in Kansas. Betty met and started dating a boy named Jimmy, and he was handsome and just enough older than Betty that it seemed too far out of reach for a high schooler like herself. Betty had dreamed of being a school teacher since before she was old enough for that to be a real dream. She and Jimmy had a wedding date set for four years into the future, but Betty abruptly ended the relationship with Jimmy before she went on a school's annual senior field trip to the Ozarks. Betty realized that there was more to life than what was in Kansas, and she intended to find out exactly what was out there. After graduation, Betty headed off to Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas on an $800 scholarship, where she continued to woo young boys and have them fawn over her. And it was there in 1968 that Betty would meet Alan Gore. Alan was a senior at the college, and he was a teacher assistant for freshman math. Betty caught Alan's attention from the very first time he laid his eyes on her. She was a natural kind of pretty, with a wide smile, and Alan was just too shy to ask Betty out. So when Betty asked Alan if he could tutor her in math, that was basically their happily ever after that neither one of them could have saw coming. Well, their happily ever after wouldn't come until after the first semester of tutoring. Alan didn't think it was appropriate to date a student, so after the second semester of tutoring, Alan wasn't her teacher anymore, and the two started dating. Betty was Alan's very first girlfriend, but Betty had dated a few men and even went steady with a few of them in high school. Alan grew up just three counties over from where Betty had grown up, and their relationship progressed. Alan was a very plain man, and even though he was only 21 years old, he already showed signs of a receding hairline. 
And whatever excitement that Betty thought that she could find when she left Kansas wasn't in Allen. The two mostly hung out at local libraries and went to the movies together. And they slowly drifted into an engagement, even though Betty's choice and husband shocked her friends and family back home in Kansas. When she brought him home to meet everyone for the first time, Alan rarely spoke, and he wasn't much of a looker, but the two seemed happy. They married on January 25th, 1970, and they started their lives together. They spent a two-day honeymoon at a cheap motel off the interstate, just 50 miles away from where they would live. They moved into a basement apartment together, and Betty worked odd jobs and tried to help make ends meet. Alan got a job offer, and the couple were planning to move for the job offer to Las Cruces, New Mexico. After this move to New Mexico, Alan was sent on a six-week business trip, and Betty was not okay with being left alone at all. She did not want to be left alone without her husband, not even for one night. And she made sure that this was no secret. She made it very clear that she didn't like it, and she wasn't just going to go along with it without making a fuss about it. Though this was the only way that they could stay afloat and help pay their bills, she still wasn't thrilled about the idea. Alan continued working for this same company, and it seemed like he was going to be working this same job forever. So he decided to send his resume to multiple different American electronic companies across the United States, and one of the only few places that reached back out to him was Collins Radio, which would later merge with Rockwell International, located in Richardson, Texas. A few months after he heard back from what would later be known as Rockwell International, he stopped by there on his way back home from a business trip, and he was offered a job on the spot. It would be about the same amount of money, more meaningful work for Alan, and he would have the opportunity to excel with this new company, and it would be a good change of pace for both him and Betty. This is when Betty and Alan bought a house and moved to Plano, Texas, which is where they would eventually meet Candy and Pat Montgomery. Betty got a temporary substitute teaching job since the school year was almost over when they moved, and she was able to find a more permanent teaching job over the summer. It was only a few months after Betty and Alan moved to Plano that Betty found out that she was pregnant with their first daughter, who they would name Alyssa. This delivery was extremely hard on Betty, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. And Betty and Alan's first daughter was the same daughter that would inevitably become best friends with Candy and Pat's daughter, Jenny. With Betty's pregnancy and delivery came a large dose of depression. And it didn't seem to go away since she gave birth. No one knew that Betty was suffering from postpartum depression except for her husband, Alan. I feel like in the 70s, if you were to go to the doctor for postpartum depression, they would probably tell your husband to get his overly dramatic wife in check, tell you that you're fine, and suck it up, probably rub some dirt on it. Betty finally did get a job as a permanent teacher to a second grade classroom, but the teaching methods that Betty knew and loved weren't used in the school that she was teaching in. The kids in her class became overbearing and hard to handle. They were extremely disrespectful, and this was just another emotional roller coaster on top of the depression she's already trying to deal with. Betty had a hard time making friends at the school that she was teaching at because a lot of the teachers thought that she was too strict, too disciplined, and that she took the Bible and her religion far too seriously. She was teaching second grade after all, so you have to kind of have some kind of patience for that age range. Alan was still having to go away for days at a time on business trips, leaving Betty home alone, battling depression, with no friends, and a new baby, in a new city where she has no one. That seems like it would be a lot for anybody. It didn't help that Alan was becoming more and more involved in the church that they had found. Like Candy and Pat, Betty and Alan had also joined the church just because they thought it would be what was best for their daughter. Alan worked his way up the ranks at the church and was eventually the chairman of the Council of Ministries. Betty was turned down for a teaching position as the new school year approached, and now she's jobless, going through probably what I would guess would be the deepest and darkest depression she's ever experienced. And then Alan was told that he would have to travel out of country for six weeks for work. So that's a nice cherry on top of her depression Sunday. It was during this trip that Betty called Alan's boss and basically begged him to stop sending Alan on these long business trips and to let him stay and work in town without having to go out of town for business. This is when Alan finally realized that it wasn't just Betty whining, that she had a real extreme anxiety about him being away. And in 1979, Alan finally spoke with his boss and he was assigned a different position where he would be able to work primarily in Dallas and stay home. Betty and Alan sold their house, they quit their church in April of 1977, and they moved to Wiley, Texas. 
This move to Wiley for the Gore family happened when their daughter Alyssa was about three years old. The family packed up their belongings and their dog named Cheeto, which is the best name I've ever heard for a dog, and they made it to Wiley. This was going to be closer to Betty's new teaching job that she had found, and it seemed like it was going to be a fresh start for both of them. A friend of Betty's told her about a church that she thought they might love, and the two started attending services pretty regularly. Now, this would be the same Methodist church where Candy and Pat Montgomery also attended. Candy and Betty were the same age, they both had young girls, and they probably had a lot more in common than what either one of them realized. They should have been friends. They probably could have been friends, but they weren't. Betty seemed too snobby and too high and mighty to be somebody that Candy could befriend. Candy and Helen were on the church volleyball team together, and the Montgomery's oldest daughter, Jenny, was starting to grow extremely close with the Gore's daughter, Alyssa. Alyssa and Jenny were starting to do sleepovers all the time, and they went to the vacation Bible school together. The girls tried to spend as much free time together as their parents would allow. Candy was said to be friends with literally everybody at their church, and there was a lady that was actually interviewed about both of these couples, and she said that Candy was always the first to volunteer for anything, and that everybody just loved her. Betty, on the other hand, didn't have very many friends, and she took the Bible pretty seriously, even more seriously than most of the people who attended the church pretty regularly. But Candy was slowly growing tired of the same old, same old in her everyday life. She was bored with her marriage, she was bored with her church life, and she was bored with being a 24-7 mom, and she decided that she just needed more excitement in her life. Candy had actually already been talking to some of her close girlfriends about having an affair. She didn't exactly want to end her marriage, but she thought that an affair with someone new would spice things up for her marriage. She was talking pretty openly about having an affair, but only for the sex, and she talked with these friends about it for weeks and weeks. Candy just wanted to find a man to have an affair with, not someone to fall in love with, because she had a husband for that. Just someone to have sex with, because apparently you can't have sex with your husband, Uh, I'm not sure. She wanted to have somebody that she could have sex with that ended with torn off clothes and loud moans and basically somebody that just wasn't her husband, Pat. Some of Candy's friends that she had talked to this affair about even later said that Candy told them that her life was just pretty boring and that she wanted someone she could have fireworks with. Candy Montgomery and Alan Gore knew each other from church and from their daughters being best friends and they were around each other at church pretty often since they both volunteered for basically any church event. And Candy started to notice Alan in a more sexual way at one of these volleyball practices where they were spending more of their time without their spouses around. And she wondered if Alan might be the perfect man to have this affair with. At this volleyball practice that the church was holding, she accidentally bumped into Alan where they were both going for the same hit of the ball on the volleyball court. She noticed that Alan smelled nice, and it also didn't hurt that he wasn't her husband. She figured it would at least be worth a try. Alan would be Candy's first option, but if that didn't work, she would just find someone else. And when Candy finally got the chance to talk to Alan, she made him the deal of a lifetime. She basically made it pretty clear that she just wanted crazy hot, steamy sex without the relationship part. No feelings. No strings attached, just good old-fashioned, hot, steamy sex. That's all she wanted. Which is another thing I don't get, because when you look at pictures, it's not like Alan's, like, M&M hot. He's very average Joe, with a really bad receding hairline, and he kind of looks like the guy that you'd picture your friend's dad looking like. He's nothing special to look at. So, if you're gonna risk your entire marriage on an affair... Why not make it somebody that's at least nice to look at? Alan, of course, seemed to be all in for the just sex part with no strings attached, but only in theory. Almost like it sounded like a good idea for a few different reasons, but in other ways it sounded like a terrible idea. So he's at least using his brain and not his Johnson to consider the pros and cons. Alan's wife Betty only wanted to have sex when she was at her most fertile so that she would be more likely to get pregnant with her second child. But even when she was her most fertile and the two did have sex, it was very vanilla, if you catch my drift. Like, she only wanted to have sex to have another baby. But at the same time, let's remember there's a lot of things going on for Betty 
as far as depression and dealing with Alan leaving for work. So there's no way to place blame on Betty for this. She's also trying to line up her second pregnancy with the time that she would be out of school for summer so that she wouldn't have to miss work. So between Betty suffering from postpartum depression and feeling alone and pretty useless at her job and being left alone all the time while her husband's either at church or traveling for work, of course she's not jumping his bones every time he walks through the door. And it may just be a sign of the times, but it seems like Betty needed some kind of medical professional diagnosis for her depression and possibly a medical treatment for whatever she was going through. But like I said, probably just a sign of the times. Alan told Candy that he didn't think that he could have an affair with her because he didn't think he could hurt Betty in that way. He explained that Betty was already going through a lot and he didn't want to put any more on her and he especially didn't want to hurt her. So Candy told him that she understood completely and that she would never bring up the affair to him again. Simple enough, right? And honestly, before Alan told her this, I honestly don't think that Candy had even thought about how the affair would affect her husband Pat or Alan's wife Betty before this. I mean, I honestly don't think it even crossed her mind. Candy and Pat's sex life had died down some, and they had just kind of gotten to where they coexisted in the same house. And Alan and Candy had been talking about this in Candy's car, so as Alan goes to get out of her car, and he and Candy agreed that they would never speak of this affair thing again, Alan leaned over the seat and kissed Candy. So this wasn't exactly the stern no that he had just been portraying to her just a few minutes before this when she threw the idea out there to him. And it was a few weeks after Candy made her proposal of an affair to Alan that he had come to realize that his marriage was rocky at best and that he had never been with anyone sexually besides Betty. And he couldn't help but wonder if it wouldn't kind of be fun to be in a secret affair with no strings attached. Candy and Alan were both leaving choir practice when Alan told Candy that he needed to talk to her about something and the two ended up setting up a dinner date for Candy's 29th birthday that was coming up. Alan told Candy that they could discuss the affair in more detail when he took her out to dinner for her birthday. And at Candy's birthday dinner, Alan gave Candy a birthday card and when she opened it, it said, For the last of the Red Hot Lovers. And inside the card was a tiny bag of Red Hot Cinnamon Candies. So naturally, Candy thought that this was an adorable gesture, but she also thought that this was Alan's way of saying that he had made his mind up and that he was ready to move forward with their plans of having an affair. But during the dinner, as the conversation turned more towards talk of the affair and its details, Alan still seemed really hesitant and not completely on board still. And in the days and weeks after this birthday dinner between Candy and Alan, they went about their normal lives with their spouses but they were talking with each other on the phone multiple times a day. Alan still needed persuading, and he would call Candy and ask her about small details that he hadn't thought of before in regards to the affair. Eventually, Candy was growing pretty tired of playing 21 questions with Alan every day when he called, and she was ready to either go for it or stop talking about it and find someone else to have the affair with. She was done waiting, but she still had one more trick up her sleeve that she could use to try to convince him. Candy told Alan on one of their many phone calls together, playing 21 questions of course, that she was going to make them both a nice lunch and that he could come to her house and they would decide once and for all if the affair was going to happen or not. She ended the call by telling Alan, quote, You know, if you don't go to bed with me pretty soon, Alan, then you'll never be able to live up to the expectation I have of you in bed. She laughed and Alan said, quote, I know, I've thought of that. And the two proceeded to hang up the phone call. So they're basically hyping the sex up between each other, and they're both starting to realize it, and now they're wondering if they're even going to be able to live up to their own expectations. So during this lunch that would inevitably decide their future, Candy made her famous lasagna for lunch while her husband Pat was at work, and Alan drove to Candy's house during his two-hour lunch break while his wife Betty was also at work. That way, if they decided not to go through with the affair, neither one of their spouses would be the wiser. While the lasagna was cooking, Candy got out a huge white piece of butcher paper that would normally be used to wrap up raw meats in a butcher shop, and she tacked it to the wall of her living room. She drew a line down the middle and labeled one side whys, and the other side was labeled why nots. When Alan walked in, he kind of laughed at the pros and cons list that she had made, but after they ate lunch, they did sit down on the couch to kind of weigh out the options of the whys and the why nots. Some of the pros were companionship, the adventure of it all, the thrill of something new, and bringing excitement to their life. 
The why not side of the list was the side of the list that Alan seemed to be more focused on, more so than the side of the whys. The why not side, of course, listed the fear of getting caught, the fear of hurting their spouses, and the fact that this was one of the biggest sins that you could commit between God and the Bible. Even though Candy herself had claimed to not be very religious, this is just not good Christian behavior in general. Alan still seemed to be leaning more towards the why not side until Candy got up and wrote sex at the bottom of the whys list. Alan told her that he still wasn't sure and Candy thought that she had spent enough time trying to convince him and that she would just let the whole thing go. That was until a few days later, after the infamous pros and cons list lunch date at Candy's house, when Alan called Candy to let her know that he had finally decided on going forward with the affair, but only after the two laid down some extensive rules that they would follow as if they were written by Congress. Alan's biggest and arguably most important rule is that there would be absolutely no emotions involved whatsoever. This was strictly for sex and nothing more. Another equally important rule is that if either one of them decided to call the affair quits for any reason, that they would both agree and there would be no questions asked about why the affair was being cut off. Some more rules that were laid out were that the two would split the cost of the motel room, the gas, etc., and they would split those costs equally. And that if either one of them started taking unnecessary risk, that the affair would be over without question. Candy would be in charge of making basically a full course meal lunch and booking the motel rooms for their stay. And lastly, Alan and Candy would only meet up at the agreed upon motel room once every other week for the full two hours that Alan had off on his lunch break, which who's giving out two hour lunch breaks? I need to get a job like that. Candy and Alan finally agreed that their affair would start formally on December 12th, 1978 at the Continental Inn. And for the first of many of the two's sexual rendezvous, Candy packed a full course meal for lunch. She prepared marinated chicken, a fresh salad with tomatoes and bacon bits. Of course, she had the Thousand Island dressing along with white wine and cheesecake for dessert. She also packed along all the silverware, tablecloths, disposable cups and napkins that they would need for their lunch. She packed up this meal in her picnic basket, and she also tucked her favorite nightie into the side of her purse as she set out to meet Alan for the first of many rendezvous at the very seedy motel that they had agreed to meet at. Candy later says that the seedier the motel that they used to meet at for the affair, the more exciting and dangerous that it seemed. The two ate lunch, and they sat quietly on either side of the bed before Alan finally got up and touched Candy gently on her shoulder. Neither one of them had realized how nervous that they would actually be, but as soon as Alan touched Candy's shoulder, all the nervousness and tension in the room just kind of seemed to melt away. Candy was surprised by how unexperienced Alan seemed to be, and how short of an event this actually was. Because remember, they have worked up this sex act for weeks and weeks. This should have been life-altering, mind-blowing, lasted-for-eight-hours type of sex. And it just wasn't. It was very short-lived and very unexperienced. But Alan was gentle and he was generous, and Candy figured that with time he wouldn't be so nervous, and she hoped that maybe the next time, or even later on in the future, their sexy time would last a little longer. She also thought that Alan was very teachable. And by the time they both left the Continental Inn, they were giddy and excited for the next time that they would be able to get the chance to do this in exactly two weeks. The next time they would meet up for sex in a CD motel, it would be at the Como Motel. And they would meet up this time right before the Christmas holidays. Candy had noticed that the Como Hotel was a smaller and even seedier motel than the one they had originally met at the first time. And she was excited to tell Alan that the Coma Motel actually ended up being about 2 to $3 cheaper. So when Candy called Alan at his job to let her know that she was waiting for him with lunch prepared, she also let him know that she had been able to find a cheaper room because, remember, they are splitting all of these expenses equally. 
even though I would kind of be willing to bet my left leg that Alan didn't pay for one red penny in regard to their elaborate lunches that Candy would always make and bring with her. Maybe just another sign of the times, but I could be wrong. Maybe he paid for lunch, too. And the two would continue to meet up for sex every other week for months. But, like it eventually does, the sex brought the two of them closer together. They eventually got to where they would talk about things that were bothering them in their separate marriages. They would talk about their kids, the happenings at the church, and about their feelings and plans for the future. Candy was somehow able to still speak to Alan's wife Betty at church gatherings and when Candy's daughter and Betty's daughter planned sleepovers, and Alan was still able to speak to Candy's husband Pat about normal things when they saw each other as well. It's like they weren't even talking to the same spouses that they were actively cheating on with their secret lovers. Betty had no idea that Alan was sleeping with Candy, and Pat had no idea that Candy was sleeping with Alan. The affair went on like this for some time, and eventually Candy started leaving small gifts or sweet notes under the windshield of Alan's car when he left the motels after their time together. And Alan and his wife Betty were expecting their second child soon. It only took a few months before the sex that still wasn't lasting very long and was still extremely vanilla started to become less and less exciting for Candy. So when Alan told Candy that they needed to take a few months off from their affair so that he could be there for his wife during her last trimester of pregnancy, Candy was more than okay with that. But she was so much more than just okay with it that she actually threw Betty a baby shower later on. I'm sorry, who throws a baby shower for the wife of the man that you're having an affair with. Where'd they do that? And I feel like in the late 70s, missing your wife's call to you at work to tell you that she's in labor would be a surefire way to get caught cheating with your mistress, so probably a good call on Alan's part. And even though there was talk of taking a break from the affair, both Candy and Alan were at the point where they were both being intimate together sexually and emotionally, As far as talking about their plans for the future, and even the days when they had really bad days, they would talk about those things together. So these are all things that they're not doing with their spouses, which is just causing an even bigger divide between both of their marriages. Candy did eventually tell Alan that she thought she was catching feelings for him in a way that went beyond just the sex. But Alan assured Candy that he had this entire affair thing under control, and that he would stop things before he got feelings too, and it became too much. He even went on to say that with Betty giving birth soon and them having to put their affair on hold, that it should help shut some of those feelings down since they wouldn't be around each other so often. Because that's how that works. So, Candy does throw Betty a baby shower. You know, the wife of her personal sex toy. Betty and Alan brought their second daughter, Bethany, into the world in July of 1979. And it would only take a few weeks after Bethany was born for Alan and Candy to resume their affair with one another, just like they had planned. Things were supposed to go back to the way they had been before between Candy and Alan, but things just felt different this time between them. Things didn't seem to be so effortless and easy as they had once been before between Candy and Alan. Alan was starting to think that this affair was starting to affect his marriage in a negative way. No, Alan, an affair would never do that. And he was starting to think this, even though he was pretty sure that Betty still had no idea about the affair at all. Alan was starting to worry that his feelings for his wife Betty were changing. He wasn't very interested in having sex with his wife anymore, and he started to wonder if he even still loved Betty at all. Even though after the birth of their second child, the two seemed to be more connected and closer than they had been in years. Betty grew up being taught that sex was bad and evil unless it was for the purpose of recreation. So, she had never initiated sex with Alan before. He was always the one that kind of had to get the motor going, so to speak. But one night, she did initiate sex with Alan for the first time, which is something that she had never done before throughout their entire marriage. But, because Alan had been with Candy earlier that day, he was tired and exhausted and not exactly in the mood, and he didn't try to hide it or even soften the blow when he told this to his wife, Betty. So, now Betty's put herself out there in a way that she had never done before, and she got denied. Of course she was upset, and of course her feelings were hurt. And she even believed that Alan didn't find her attractive anymore, which I feel like is a pretty typical way to feel about yourself after you give birth to a child. You just don't feel like yourself. And Betty started to believe that maybe something that Alan had mentioned to her previously was maybe a good idea after all. Marriage counseling. 
It had helped a lot of Betty and Alan's friends from church renew their wedding vows and their love for one another, so Betty figured, why not give it a try? Even though she had completely shut this idea down when Alan brought it up to her a few months prior, saying that she would just never be able to find the time to do it. So Betty mentioned it to Alan, and the two agreed to give it a try. This recommitment weekend getaway was called Marriage Encounter, and it was something that their church offered to any and all of their congregation. It was a three-day weekend filled with exercises and strategies and tactics that each couple could use during the weekend and also when they got home from the retreat to help bring their marriages closer together, not just for the weekend, but hopefully for good. Alan and Betty ended up connecting on this couple's retreat in a way that neither one of them could have expected. They were talking with each other, laughing, expressing their fears, concerns, goals, and dreams to one another, and they were excited to be together in all the ways that a couple is supposed to be. But a really big part of this couple's retreat was the communication part, and it seemed like Alan had just completely forgotten about the truthful fact that he had been having an affair. In fact, the couples had been instructed to speak openly with one another and not hold back any secrets of any kind from one another. Alan still hadn't told Betty about the affair between he and Candy, and he had no intentions of doing so either. He figured what was done was done, and it was in the past now. He figured that he and Betty were in such a good place, and telling her about the affair with Candy would neither help or hurt their relationship. But after the three-day-long marriage retreat did exactly what it was designed to do for Betty and Alan, the couple felt closer and more connected than they had been probably in their entire relationship. Alan and Betty even renewed their vows with one another at the end of the couple's retreat with all of the other couples attending the ceremonies together as well. And after the couple's retreat weekend went so smoothly and their relationship was healthier and happier than it had been for Betty and Alan, like I said, probably ever, Alan did finally start to feel guilty about his affair with Candy. Candy had also started showing some jealous tendencies and becoming a little more clingy to Alan than she ever had been before. Candy had kind of just gotten to the point with herself where she accepted the fact that she loved her husband Pat, but that she also loved Alan. But with Alan's marriage being in such a good place, this time Alan would be the one to call off the affair between him and Candy, and supposedly it was for good. Alan and Candy agreed to remain friends, and they finally ended their affair for good. Before it was all said and done, though, Alan had written Candy a sort of goodbye love letter, and writing letters to your spouse was part of the homework that the couple's retreat had given to Betty and Alan as a sort of lifelong homework assignment to take home and continue to do. So now here Alan is writing a farewell love letter to Candy, when he's supposed to be continuing to write these love letters to his wife, Betty. In this letter, Alan detailed some of his favorite memories that he and Candy had shared throughout the course of their affair. He wrote that he cherished their time together, he signed his name when he was done, and Candy kept this letter and all of the other cards and small little trinkets that Alan had given her. She kept them all in a drawer in her bedroom dresser, which is never a good idea. And now that Candy and Alan's affair was over for good, Candy met a man named Richard at a Halloween party, and Richard and Candy kind of started their own secret affair. I guess Candy really wasn't ready to let go of the whole affair thing at all, whether it be with Alan or somebody else. Candy and Richard started meeting up pretty regularly at a friend's apartment just to have sex, and even though Candy and Alan had kept their relationship strictly about sex, Candy and Richard started doing more relationship-type things together, like Christmas shopping, just really random things that you just don't do with somebody that you're strictly having sex with, with no emotional connection to. This affair between Candy and Richard was very short-lived. Candy ended the affair with Richard since Richard seemed to need more of Candy than what she was looking to give. Richard even propositioned Candy to marry him, telling her that he could make her happy within a marriage and life together. Richard even started showing signs of being jealous of Candy's husband, Pat, and this isn't exactly what Candy had signed up for. After Candy ended the affair with Richard, he was calling her constantly, begging her to come back to him, and I guess he kind of forgot that she was in a whole marriage already. And since she was in an actual marriage already to Pat, Candy figured that she would sign her and Pat up for the same three-day marriage retreat, that Alan had Betty had attended and had so much success with, and she hoped that maybe this would help her and Pat's relationship too. 
Cat and Candy didn't take the couple's counseling as seriously as Betty and Alan had, but they eventually did start to get more into it, and when they returned home, they did start writing their love letters back and forth, which was the same homework that Betty and Alan had been given. But after a week or so of doing these letters, they decided that they were in a good enough place to just stop the homework and the counseling tactics that they had been taught at the retreat. Candy talked with some of her closest girlfriends that knew about the affair, and she told them that she thought the affair was what she was looking for for a while, but that after a little bit, the sex felt routine and it just wasn't as exciting as it was in the beginning. So this time she figured instead of an affair, Candy would find something just for herself to try to find some kind of fulfillment for her life. She took some writing classes, she tried painting, and th none of those things seemed to really fill the void that she was looking to fill. So Candy and her best friend Sherry decided to start a small kind of home improvement business where they would kind of go in and repaint houses, organize things inside the clients' homes like closets and kitchens, they would replace wallpaper, just little ins and outs that they could do to make extra money and fill time and voids, hopefully. Candy figured that if she got more involved in church, that it would occupy her time and some of her energy, so that's exactly what she did. Alan's wife, Betty, had invited Candy and Pat over for dinner as a sort of a marriage retreat dinner celebration between both couples. And Pat and Betty were still none the wiser about the affair between Candy and Alan. During this dinner, Alan gave Candy a greeting card that said something along the lines of he was glad to have a friend like her in his life. And when Candy and Pat got home from this dinner with Betty and Alan, Candy put the greeting card in the same dresser drawer where she had kept all of the other cards and letters and little mementos that Alan had given her, and it wouldn't take very long for Candy's little drawer of secrets to come back and backfire on her completely. Because in April of 1980, Candy signed up for an all-women's Bible retreat and left Pat at home with the kids for the first time in a long time he was there with the kids alone. And with Candy gone, even for this short amount of time, he was just so used to her being there, and with her being away at this retreat, he was starting to miss his wife. This is when Pat started reminiscing about when he and Candy had first met and bringing back all of the memories of the couple's first summer together. And he was taking a trip down memory lane, so he wanted to read some of their old love letters, look at some of their old trinkets and pictures from when they had first gotten together. Pat went to the spot where Candy normally kept the box of love letters and pictures and trinkets so that he could relive some of their earliest memories together, but the box wasn't in the place where Candy normally kept it, and he was kind of confused when he couldn't find it. But Candy had just recently gotten into redecorating and organizing, especially since she and Sherry had opened their small business together, so Pat figured he would just look around and find it. Pat opened a few of the dresser drawers, and he plundered through some of their old stuff and in places where he thought the box might be. And when Pat opened one of the dresser drawers, he saw an envelope, and he was a little confused as to why this letter wasn't in the box with the rest of their letters, but he was excited to read any of their earlier letters regardless. He was even more confused, though, when he pulled the letter out of the envelope and unfolded the letter to see that this was a letter written to Candy, but it wasn't in Pat's handwriting. As Pat read through this letter, the letter detailed different sex acts. It even mentioned the Como Motel where Alan and Candy used to meet up. The letter even had the word affair written in it. It was also written in the letter that the times that the two shared together would be cherished forever. And as if this wasn't enough of a gut punch, towards the bottom of the letter, Alan had talked about how he would always cherish the little love via stick figure greeting cards that they had exchanged throughout their affair together. At the bottom of the letter, it was signed Alan Gore, and it was dated for October 1979. One of the biggest reasons that this entire letter was a slap to the face, besides the obvious reasons of the emotional and physical affair, was the love is stick figure greeting cards that Pat found along with all the letters. Candy and Pat had been exchanging those same cute little love is greeting cards for years and years. It was one of those things where it's kind of like it's our thing. So for her to be doing our thing with somebody else had to have been a, a hit to the chest. Because not only were the love is greeting cards their thing, but now he's finding out that she had been doing those same things with Alan for months now. Pat went through all of the normal emotions that you would think of when you find out that your wife's been cheating on you. 
He went from mad to sad to lonely to hurt, upset, betrayed, and he even felt a little foolish for having Alan sleep with his wife and then smile on his face like it was no big deal. Pat is a better man than most because he knew his wife better than anyone, so he knew how to best approach the situation of confronting Candy about the affair. Pat had never been good with spoken words, and when he wrote his words down, they seemed to come across in a way that they didn't when he spoke. So he started writing his own letter to Candy. In this letter, Pat blamed himself for Candy's affair. He blamed himself for not being there for her emotionally, physically, or mentally, and because of that, she was forced to go find these comforts in another man. Pat even apologized to Candy for making her feel like it was a task for her to be his wife and for not being there for her in the ways that she needed him to be. Pat ended this letter to Candy by confessing his love for her, his forgiveness for her, and his acceptance of the affair being his fault. Pat sat and waited until Candy got home, and after she got home, he left the house to get her a dozen roses. When Pat got home, he hid the letter and the roses underneath the couple's bed until the kids were in the bed and asleep. When Candy walked into their bedroom, Pat just handed Candy the letter and the flowers, and he turned around and walked away to give her time to read the letter and process it all. Candy read through Pat's letter over and over again until she finally just broke down crying. When Pat came back into the room, and after Candy was able to speak through her tears, she told him that she was sorry that she never meant to hurt him and that she was embarrassed by her actions. Pat accepted Candy's apology, and the two agreed to work hard to get their relationship back to a good place. Candy and Pat had planned a vacation together, and things were back to normal and better than they had been before. Candy eventually did have to tell Alan that Pat knew about their affair, but that since it was over now, there was no reason for things to be awkward. So, the two couples still remained friendly at church, and their daughters were still always having sleepovers and spending time together. Things seemed to be going about as normally as you could expect for a 1980s married couple, and it seemed like things were going to work themselves out for both couples. But eventually, Alan would be called on another business trip, and he would have to leave Betty at home alone, even though he knew how much she hated that. When Alan left for this trip on Friday, June 13th in 1980, he had no way of knowing that he would never see his wife alive again, as he watched Betty and his 11-month-old daughter Bethany wave goodbye from his rearview mirror as he drove towards the airport to board his plane. It would be later that evening when he would find out that his wife Betty had been axed to death over 40 times and was dead. And this is where we will stop for Candy Montgomery, part one. And if you're as intrigued by this case as I am, I will see you next week. Same time, same place, next Wednesday for part two. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.